Hey everybody! Welcome back to my channel. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you're new here, welcome. If you've been here before, I hope that you already know how much I love you guys. I love interacting with you. I love that you're a part of this little family that I built around me. And just thank you so much for all your love and support. My name is Dana Trubiana, and I cover infamous gangsters every week in a true crime-like format. My show, Mob Times, comes out every Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. Sometimes. Well, it's Tuesday, it's 10 a.m., so... So here I am. It is cold as shit in New York, okay? Like really freaking cold. I know there was like a week or two that the South was like experiencing our weather and I also know that Georgia was like 80 degrees the other day, okay? So I don't want to hear about, oh, I understand your pain. No, no, you don't because New York sucks. I can't wait to get out of this godforsaken state and back down South. So my job relocated and I am officially working in Manhattan again, which makes me want to die a little bit because I actually joined the army originally because I wanted out of Manhattan. I hate Manhattan with a burning, fiery passion. It's the worst place in the world. New York City is like literally just one big cesspool, okay? And that's not an insult to you if you live there. You're not a cesspool, but the area you live in is. And I know you agree with that. Nobody likes living in New York. And the fact that I'm living on the island and commuting to Manhattan every single day, which is a two and a half, three hour drive each way, is super fun. I love that for me. It's cool though, because I'm only working Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. It's a lot more me time. And I'm off this whole week, so like I'm working from home this whole week, which is amazing because I have all the time in the world. So like, you know, I have a whole bunch of stuff on, like my eyelashes and stuff that I don't usually have because I've been sitting around all day today just fucking around. So that is what is going on in my life. You'll probably start seeing a lot more pictures on my Instagram of Manhattan stuff. I'm working downtown on Wall Street again, so yay. But I'm the CEO. I have to be there. So, you know, it makes sense. Finance. New York City is the best place to be for that industry. I just don't like that I have to be there. Today we're going to take an in-depth look at one of the most infamous and notorious Irish-American gangsters of all time. A violent and ruthless criminal responsible for countless murders and one of the largest cash robberies in American history. He is even one of the real-life goodfellas. He had a reputation for being a gentleman, but that didn't stop him from being one of the most dangerous masterminds the Mafia had ever seen. This week's episode is about Jimmy Burke, also known as James the Gent, and was requested among a bunch of other gangsters by Arthur Jones. So thank you, Arthur Jones, for the suggestion. And I told you I was going to make a lot of your suggestions into videos, and this is the first. was born on July 5th, 1931 in New York. Burke was born originally named James Conway, but he was an orphan who didn't know his father or mother, and he was abandoned at only two years old. So obviously, because he was abandoned at two years old, there is no information out there about who his birth parents were, what kind of family they were, whether he has any siblings or relatives or not. He has no idea, so we have no idea. Nobody knows. This is way before the time of, like, 23 and me, so... When he was two years old, he was placed into foster care by his mother, and during his time in foster care, he would move from foster family to foster family to foster family. This is really heartbreaking, but it's also the story that you hear from so many kids in the system. Two years old is still pretty young, but a lot of parents, they really just want that newborn. So a two-year-old may be past that threshold. Throughout his journey to different homes, he was treated kindly by some of the homes, but he would also be physically and sexually 
sexually abused at other homes that he was placed at. Something tragic happened in 1944 when he was 13 years old between him and his foster parents. His foster father turned back while he was driving to hit Burke for something that he had said, and this led to the foster father crashing the car, and the foster father died in the crash. In the crash, the wife, now widow, and Burke both escaped and lived through the accident. The widow, his foster mother, spent the rest of the time that Burke was living with her blaming Burke, convinced that he was the cause of her husband's death. And because of that, she would ruthlessly beat Burke to a pulp on a daily basis. Not long after the death of his foster father, after multiple vicious beatings from his foster mother, Burke was taken out of this home. A family from Rockaway, Queens, adopted him. His life with this new family became a lot more pleasant, a lot more calm, and they created a lifelong relationship. This was the forever family that he had spent his entire life looking for, and he finally found it at 13 years old. He lived with this family for the remainder of his childhood. Years after Burke had established himself, he would go back and visit this family consistently, and he would send them money whenever he wasn't able to make it home to visit. I would assume that whenever he came, he would give them money as well, so it was just a way of showing how grateful that he was to this family that had taken him in and put an end to all of the years of horror that he had experienced as a kid. When Burke was young, but just old enough to work, he was able to establish himself as a bricklayer, which made him really strong, but it didn't last very long. While he was a bricklayer, he was also scheming and pulling off your odd crime. You could take the kid out of the hood, but not the hood out of the kid, apparently. Burke started his criminal career at a very young age, but he only spent 86 days behind bars between the ages of 16 and 22 years old. So he's a criminal, but he's a good criminal because he doesn't get caught that often. It actually becomes something that he'll be known for in the future, his knack for getting away with things. The interesting part is that while he was in prison, he murdered people for both the Lucchese family and the Colombo family, and he was released. That means that he killed multiple people while in prison under federal or state lockup and was able to kill people and get away with it and still get out of prison. Gradually, Burke started to develop a passion for being a gangster and started making money through extortion, bribery, drug dealing, loan sharking, hijacking, and armed robbery. Something funny but crazy happened in 1962 when Burke married his girlfriend Mickey and discovered that she was being bothered by her ex-boyfriend. Burke decided that was just not acceptable. Burke killed her ex-boyfriend, and when police found the body at the same time that Burke was marrying Mickey, it was chopped up into 12 separate pieces and left in his car. Burke routinely killed informants and had a lot of corrupt cops on the payroll to ensure that he never got caught for any of this. After getting married, Burke and Mickey would have three children together. They named their first son Frank James Burke. He would go on to help with the Lufthansa heist, and he was later murdered by Tito Ortiz, a drug dealer, in 1987. His second son was named Jesse James Burke. I wonder where they got that name from, but he never did anything that crazy. And they had a daughter together named Catherine Burke, who would go on to marry Anthony Indelicato, a Bonanno crime family member. Burke was full-blown Irish, so because of that, he was demoted to associate status under Capo Paul Vario, which prevented him from rising to the status of made man in the American Mafia. So, like, he was running his own crew like a capo in the Mafia would, but he obviously wasn't in the Mafia because he was Irish. That is a rule that goes back as far as time. I have no idea why he thought that he could become a MAID member. Maybe because he had done a lot of really brutal things and rose through the ranks in the Mafia, and you don't typically see non-Italians rising through the ranks. But let's never forget that even Meyer Lansky, 
was never given the made man title, and he was a key player in creating the mafia. So if he wasn't given it, nobody without Italian ancestry would be given that title. All throughout the 1950s, Burke got himself involved in a lot of illegal activities, but his niche was distributing untaxed cigarettes and liquor. So even though prohibition is over and liquor and all kinds of alcoholic substances are legal again, he is distributing this untaxed so the people that are buying it are paying a little less money so they buy it through him. Soon enough, Burke became a mentor to Thomas D. Simone, Henry Hill, and Angelo Seppi during the 1960s. Burke owned a South Ozone Park Queens Tavern named Robert's Lounge. Fast forward to November of 1972, when Burke and Hill were arrested for beating Gaspar Chicho in Tampa, Florida. Chicho owed a lot of money for a gambling debt to their friend Casey Rosado, who was a union boss. This led to Burke and Hill being charged with extortion. They were convicted of it, they were found guilty, and they were each sentenced to 10 years in the United States Penitentiary in Lewisburg. So let's talk about this crime for a little bit. You can watch Goodfellas and see this whole situation play out on the big screen. Yes, that movie wrote this real-life crime scene right into the script. It was too good to leave out. In the movie, Ray Liotta, playing Henry Hill, tells Gaspar Chicho that he's going to throw him into a lion's cage at the Tampa Zoo if he doesn't pay what he owes. In the real version, there wasn't any lion or a threat of a lion, but... That's just Hollywood for you. In the real version, they threatened to stuff his children into a refrigerator, force his wife into prostitution, and blow his bar up if he got any ideas of going to the police. If you ask me, the real life situation is way scarier than the one that they wrote in Hollywood. I don't know why they went with the lion thing because what actually happened was way scarier. Gaspar Chicho was the owner of Temple Terrace Lounge, a lounge slash liquor store in Tampa, Florida. A friend of Chicho's, a man named Raul Charbonnier Jr., owned a similar weird fusion of a lounge slash liquor store in the Tampa area called Char Pal. In 1970, Charbonnier goes up to Chicho and he's like, dude, I have an amazing proposal for you. You got some dough, right? I can get you money. And he's like, all right, so here's the stitch. I can get a rigged line or odds sheet on baseball games this season. I have an in. My cousin Poopy in New York does this for a living man. I already talked to him about you and he's agreed to let you in on this scheme. So Chicho is like, oh hell yeah man, what could possibly go wrong? This shady dude from a city known for organized crime is offering me free money and it's a guarantee? There is no downside. He goes to a friend of his, Dr. Felix Lo Cicero, and tells him about this juicy tip that he got. Surefire way to make money. I know you have some money. I got some money. Let's combine our money and make more money. Lo Cicero introduces himself to Raul and it is a go. Chicho and Lo Cicero start placing bets in June of 1970. Charbonnier guaranteed that it was rigged so that the two men would win every time. New York would call Raul, let him know what bets would be guaranteed winners, and Raul would call Chicho and Lo Cicero, and he would tell them about these, and they would be like, oh yeah, put like 10 G's down on that bitch. No, I'm, I'm kidding. But in real life, they started by just dipping their toes in. They put up small numbers at first, and it actually seemed to be working. Only a month in, and the two men had racked up about $8,000 in winnings, and they really hadn't even invested that much into it. They were putting like $1,000 a game, but they were winning like crazy. It didn't take long for their luck to go the other way, though, and they started losing consistently. By August, they had lost the $8,000 that they were over, and they were deep in the hole. Even 
with the $8,000 that they were over, they had dug themselves $13,000 in the hole. So they're scratching their head and they're like, what the hell is going on? Why are we losing? These bets are supposed to be guaranteed winners. Chicho is like, you know what? I got this buddy. His name is Tony Marchese. He bets like a crazy person. Let me bring these rigged lines to him and see what he thinks. Marchese takes a look at the odds sheets and he's like, what the hell? This is so weird. I legit have the exact opposite for every single game than you do. Sorry to inform you of this, dude, but you're being set up to lose. So Chicho and Los Cicero hear this and they are hissed. They're like, yeah, you're a scammer. Fuck you. I'm not giving you shit. You lied to me. They call Charbonnier and they're like, I am on to you. I know what you did. You lied. We're not paying you diddly squat. Lo Cicero made one final payment of $1,000 on August 24th, and then the pair ghosted Charbonnier. Yeah, Charbonnier would pop up here and there. Sometimes he would bring his brother Louis along, and that would help to stir the pot, and he tried to seem scary. He would press them for money, but these men were scammed. They were not paying for this clear and intentional dupe. Charbonnier made repeated attempts to collect the money. He told Chicho there was some really scary guys that he actually owed the money to in New York, and they were pissed. Chicho continued to ignore him and yell indignantly that he was a scam artist and he wasn't getting a dime from him. Tensions rose steadily until October 8th came around. Jimmy Burke, Henry Hill, Luis Lopez, and Casey Cosmo Rosado hop on a plane in New York headed for Tampa. Unbeknownst to Chicho and Los Cicero, when Raul was calling New York, he was calling these dudes, associates of the actual mafia. Luis Charbonnier, Cosmo, and the rest of the gang pile up into Cosmo's rental car, and they head over to Chicho's lounge. They arrive at the Temple Terrace Lounge, and lo and behold, there's Chicho. They confront Chicho, and they're trying not to make a scene, because they're on his turf right now. They tell him to get in the car, and that they're gonna head over to Charpal. When Chicho refused to relocate to another location, Burke put a gun to his ribs. He went with them, obviously, with a gun to his ribs, and when they arrived at Charbonnier's lounge, the Charpel, that's where the beating started. His forehead was split open with a pistol, his life was threatened, and he was placed in a stock room where he was beat some more, exactly the way that you see it happen on Goodfellas. As they walked into Charpel, Raul told Chicho, I told you this was gonna happen to you, didn't I? I told you this. They called his brother, who he owned and operated this liquor lounge with, and told him that they were holding Chicho hostage, and they told him why they were holding him hostage. His brother, Faino Chicho, headed over to Charpal. He said that he did not have this money, so the group ended up letting Chicho go, and said that the pair had one week to produce the $8,000 that he owed. Chicho headed to the hospital and got some stitches, he got fixed up, he came home and he immediately started making phone calls. He was able to borrow the $8,000 from relatives and paid this gang of ruffians what he owed them. They did not forget about Lo Cicero, though, and they still haven't been paid their total amount. The outstanding $4,000 was up to Lo Cicero to pay, which he did. He came to Charbonnier and gave them the $4,000 the morning after Chicho's beating in order to avoid the gangsters coming to see him as well. So they started out owing $13,000. Lo Cicero paid them $1,000 right away. Chicho paid $8,000, Lo Cicero paid an additional $4,000, they collected their whole $13,000, and they headed home. As soon as the New York guys arrived back home, Lo Cicero and Chicho went to the police. Burke, Hill, Lopez, and the Charbonnier brothers were all arrested, and the case was tried pretty quickly. It was tried on March 17th. They were charged with kidnapping, extortion, assault, and assault with intent to murder Chicho. 
Burke, Hill, and Lopez were found not guilty on the fifth charge, the intent to murder. They were found guilty of the first four charges, and the Charbonnier brothers, they were found guilty of every charge brought against them. And each of the men were given a 10-year prison sentence each. After six years, Burke was granted parole, just like his friend Hill, who had been freed two years earlier. And immediately when he got freed, he returned back into the criminal underworld. The Lucchese family placed a ban on trafficking illegal narcotics, but despite the ban, Hill and Burke still kept trafficking the narcotics. The Lucchese family would start to fear that their associates would turn into informants in exchange for lighter sentences if they were ever charged with drug dealing, which Hill did later on in 1980. But at the end of the day at the time, what can you really do? These guys aren't made guys. They're not in the mafia. They don't have to listen to the mafia's rules or laws or anything that you have to say. They do what they want, and that is the benefit of not being made men. In 1970, Hill and Burke hosted a welcome home party for William Billy Bats Bentvina at Robert's Lounge, which Burke owned, after Bentvita was released from jail. Bentvita had been in jail for the past eight years for a drug deal that he did with an undercover cop and for smuggling heroin. He had been sentenced with Carmine Galante, and originally he got 15 years, but he was out in eight on good behavior. At the party, Bentvina saw Tommy De Simone, one of the members of Burke's crew, and jokingly asked him if he still shined shoes as he did when he was a kid. D. Simone took it personal, and he looked at it like it was an insult. So D. Simone walks towards Hill and Burke and tells them how he felt by saying, I'm gonna kill that fuck. D. Simone waited around, counting the minutes, until he could do something about this. It's portrayed in Goodfellas as having happened instantly, but in real life, he waited over two weeks to actually do anything about it. He got mad, he removed himself from the situation. In everybody's eyes, he did the right thing. He didn't do anything about it. Bent Vita was a made guy, and De Simone really didn't want that kind of heat of messing with a made guy. But what happened next kind of made an altercation inevitable. It's late at night on June 11th, 1970, and the guys are hanging out at The Suite, a nightclub that Burke owned. Bent Vina, ever the instigator, yelled, Shine these fucking shoes! It's late at night, the club is nearly empty, and De Simone had officially had enough. He pulled out his pistol and beat the ever-loving dog shit out of Bent Vina. Bent Vina was assumed to be dead due to how much De Simone had beat him and what state he was in. And without wasting much time, De Simone, Burke, and Hill placed Bent Vina's body in the trunk of Hill's car and they start driving to go bury the body. But while they're driving, they start hearing some strange noises coming out of the car's trunk. They stop to check what the hell is making this noise, only to see that Bent Vina is still alive. Can you freaking imagine? Can you imagine being Bent Vina in this situation? Or can you imagine being any of the dudes in the car? It's like looking at a ghost. Like, ugh. That is freaking horrible for any person involved. <laughs> D. Simone and Burke finished up the job with a shovel and a tire iron. Goodfellas changed the scene to them using a gun because the real-life murder was just too brutal and gory to show to the public. Bent Vita was laid to rest at a dog kennel owned by a friend of Burke's in upstate New York. Burke gave the order to exhume Bent Vina's body and dispose of it somewhere else three months after the murder when his friends sold the dog kennel to real estate investors who were planning to develop on the land so they knew that the body would be discovered and they had to move it from the place that they originally put it three months earlier. So here comes the interesting part of the Jimmy Burke story, the Lufthansa heist. The heist was planned and plotted by Burke, and it was executed by a number of his associates. Burke first began plotting this plan several months before he actually put it into action. When he was in a dinner with a bookkeeper, his associate, Henry Hill, heard of a shocking arrangement that was taking place at New York's JFK airport. 
He had a dude named Lewis Werner, who was a supervisor at the airport, giving him all kinds of information. The information was that once a month, Lufthansa flew in millions of dollars that are not traceable in American currency into its cargo terminal at the airport. And this is a result of monetary exchanges made for servicemen and tourists in West Germany. The money always comes through the Lufthansa airplanes, and once it arrives, it is stored inside the JFK vaults. In prior years, a lot of the employees had stolen money from the $22,000 from Lufthansa foreign currency. So the 22000 is what was on the books. Who knows what it was before that? It was probably somewhere around fifty, sixty thousand. 60000 People didn't get greedy. They left a lot of money there. But it's too easy not to steal it. Moreover, this information was originally leaked by Louis Werner, who was a worker at the airport, and he owed Krugman, one of Jimmy Burke's associates, $20,000 for gambling debts. That would be around $89,000 today. From himself and his co-worker, Peter Grunewald, gambling. So Burke decided to choose six men from the Lucchese family, which were Tommy D. Simone, Angelo Seppe, Louis Cafora, Joe Manry, Paolo Licastri, and Robert McMahon as the robbers. He also appointed his son Frank to drive the backup vehicle, and lastly, he handpicked one member of the Gambino family whose job it was to dispose of the van after the heist. He did get members of each of the five families involved in this heist, which is how Gotti ended up being one of the main components of the heist. Burke actually ended up having a lot of people that were involved in this heist killed because he didn't want anybody to turn witness and for him to go down for this heist. Guess what each of their pay is in the heist? Well, depending on their role, each one was to receive a minimum of $10,000 up to a maximum of $50,000. And this amount was supposed to be based on the initial estimation of the total amount of what they would get from the heist, because they don't know how much money is on this plane. At the end, they ended up getting over $2 million, but in the long run, they ended up bringing in over $5 million, which is worth over $24 million today. On December 11th, 1978, An estimation of $5.875 million was stolen. Not everything was cash, $875,000 worth of jewelry, and $5 million of cash is what they ended up getting away with. And it made it the largest cash robbery committed in the history of America at the time that it was pulled off. The operation from start to finish lasted 64 minutes. Burke was believed to have ordered the killing of a lot of the robbers that were involved in order to avoid implication in the heist, as I said before. The first person that was killed was Parnell Stax Edwards on December 18th after he didn't get rid of the robbery van. This is the dude that I talked about in the Gotti video who went and stayed at his girlfriend's apartment for an entire weekend with the getaway van parked outside of her apartment complex in New York City. And if that isn't bad enough, it was parked in front of a fire hydrant. Because it was parked in front of the fire hydrant, a police officer went to write a ticket for this van and then they recognized it and they did end up impounding it and getting multiple fingerprints off the car. So... Edwards died for this, and nobody felt bad about it. While numerous people were detained and some people were put on trial, everybody was found not guilty and nobody was ever charged with the crime, other than the supervisor that worked at the JFK airport. Burke never got any charges related to the robbery, and none of the stolen cash or the jewelry was ever recovered. Lewis Werner, The supervisor at JFK was the only person that was actually charged with this crime. He was given a 15-year sentence, and one year into his sentence, he flipped and became a government informant. So after this heist, what did Burke do? Burke would go on to just continue planning low-level crimes across Ozone Park in Queens while he wasn't committing multi-million dollar heists. Burke and his crew survived day-to-day by reselling stolen goods, 
as well as untaxed alcohol and cigarettes as they were doing before. Burke's preferred strategy would involve a delivery truck and they would steal it as it would pass through Ozone Park. After stopping the truck with his boys and obtaining the driver's licenses, he would give each of the drivers $50 and advise them to forget about the situation. His crew, and later the crime families, gave him the nickname Jimmy the Gent or James the Gent due to his peculiar style of tipping. It's not very normal for when you steal a truck to give the person money. So he ended up being called a gentleman for that. Plus, he also had a lot of respect for women, and he was a very good father and a very good husband. Burke was also very well connected in the police department over the years. He was so well connected that he would literally hire officers and they would be corrupt from day one. He would pay them off to reveal who their informants were and then those informants would vanish without a trace. He personally would oversee their executions, even when it came to really close friends like Ramo Carseni. He drove Ramo around in his car and hired Tommy Simone to kill him, and then buried Ramo next to his bocce ball court after learning that Ramo was planning to frame him. So he had been in talks with the FBI, and he was planning on framing him for something so that he could get out out of a charge that was brought against him. Burke was as tough as they come, despite his polite nickname and reputation as a gentleman. He would frequently lock young children of his victims in refrigerators, he would strangle his adversaries with piano wire, and he lashed out violently at anybody who tried to harm his reputation. On January 14th, 1979, Tommy D. Simone vanished. The Gambinos ordered that he be killed. It's not really known if this was because of just the unsanctioned murder of Ben Tvina, a maid member of the Lucchese family, or if it was a combination of him and another friend of Gotti's who DeSimone had killed, Ronald Foxy Giroth. But either way, he killed the wrong person and Gotti had him offed. These two were not DeSimone's only murders, but they were the only two that got him killed. And it's up for debate if Gotti even knew that De Simone had anything to do with the murder of Bent Vina. So it's very possible that he just died because he had killed Jeroth, and Jeroth was a very good friend of Gotti's, and he had him killed. So no matter how good you are at being a criminal, no matter how well you put things together, everything is always eventually going to fall apart. Every single time. There is not one criminal that hasn't had their entire life fall apart. Early in 1982, Hill, who was Burke's closest ally, became an FBI informant and admitted that there was dozens of people buried around Roberta over the years, in which he also snitched on Burke for rigging college basketball. Basketball games. He started to testify when he was arrested in 1980 for drug trafficking. He knew that he was going to get a very long prison sentence, so like a little bitch boy, he turned government witness. Even though Burke had continually asked Hill to get out and stay out of the cocaine business, he continued to do it and eventually got to the point of making $3,000 a week. But when he was caught and he was looking at jail time like Burke knew he would, he was more than happy to throw Burke under the bus to get what he wanted, a shorter prison sentence. Burke was found guilty of conspiracy in 1982 and given a 12-year prison sentence for his role in the Boston College basketball point-shaving scandal from 1978 to 1979, largely due to the testimony of former mob associate Henry Hill. 50 people were found guilty as a result of Hill's testimony in federal court, including Burke and their boss, Capo Paul Vario, in this case, as well as multiple others. Burke was accused of killing drug dealer Richard Eaton in 1979 while he was serving that sentence. So he got the 12-year prison sentence for the point-shaving Boston College thing. And then while he was in prison for that 12-year sentence, they brought charges up against him for the murder of Richard Eaton. 
He killed Eaton after Eaton convinced Burke that a $250,000 investment into a cocaine venture that he wanted to get into would yield gigantic rewards for him. Eaton took the money and ran. Hill testified that he had asked about Eaton at one point, and Burke had responded to him, Don't worry about him. I whacked the fucking swindler out. Burke had dumped Eaton's body at a dump during the winter, and his body was found frozen a few days later by a bunch of kids that were playing in the dump area. Unbeknownst to Burke, Eaton had his name, phone number, and home address written on a little card and sewn into his jacket just in case this exact situation were to occur. Even with that, they never had enough evidence to actually come after Burke until Hill took the stand. When he was sentenced, Burke protested, The bastard died of hypothermia. Hill also tried to take Burke down for the murder of Gambino soldier William Davino, but since there was absolutely no evidence here, they didn't even bother bringing this murder up against him, even though Hill was fully willing to testify about Burke's involvement. So let's back up here a little bit and talk about Burke's involvement in the 1978-1979 Boston College point shaving scandal, because this is actually pretty interesting. He and Capo Paul Vario were found guilty for their part in shaving points in college basketball games to make sure that certain teams wouldn't win by the required margin, just pretty much fixing games so that their bets would win. It allowed any gamblers that knew that these setups had taken place to place huge wagers and they knew for a fact that they would win. Hill met the man that had set the entire thing up, Paul Mazai, during a prison sentence that he had been serving. Mazai had reached out to Hill because of his association with the Lucchese family, and he wanted Burke to finance the payments to the players and figure out who he could trust enough to let in on the scheme. Hill and Burke did get permission from Vario before moving forward, and Vario was their Lucchese connect, so this was fully cleared by the families before they moved forward. They said yes, and Burke began financing the entire operation. Burke flew to Boston on November 16, 1978, to meet up with Mazai, a few other dudes that were involved in the scheme, and the players on the Eagles basketball team that were interested in helping with this. The players were way more on board because they weren't being asked to throw games. They were just asked to make sure that the point spread didn't go too far. So it's not like they were being asked to lose on purpose, and they really liked this. The scheme was unsuccessful for their first game against Providence, but once they got more players on the Eagles involved, it was pretty much smooth sailing. It worked for games against Harvard, UCLA, Boston College, Connecticut, Fordham, and St. John's, but they lost in the game against Holy Cross. That day, Burke lost $50,000, and he put his foot through a television. He was watching the game at Hill's house in Queens, and when he saw that he lost, he literally put his foot through the television. After that game, the group was done. They did not want to deal with college children anymore. Everybody moved on, and nobody got caught. It was just kind of take your losses, take your wins, and keep moving. That is, until Hill got up on the stand and testified as to everybody's involvement. When Burke got his sentence this time, he protested, I gave the little bastard some bucks to bet on a game. That's all. So, it's never his fault, he never actually did anything wrong, the whole universe was just out to get him. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm very against people doing long-term prison sentences for things like this, but it is a little ridiculous that he is just convinced that the universe is out to get him, when you know damn well you did that. Even though authorities knew very well that Burke had planned and executed the entire Lufthansa heist, they didn't have enough evidence, and they never ended up going after him in court. Burke was diagnosed with cancer while he was in jail at the Wendy Correctional Facility in Alden, New York. While he was receiving care at Buffalo, New York's Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center, he passed away on April 13, 1996. He would have qualified for parole on March 11, 2004 if he had lived that long. 
Burke was laid to rest in East Farmingdale, New York's St. Charles Cemetery. East Farmingdale is on Long Island, so. Roberts and Nero played Jimmy Conway, a renamed James Burke, in the 1990 Martin Scorsese film Goodfellas. In the 1991 television movie, The Ten Million Dollar Getaway, which describes the events of the Lufthansa heist, John Mahoney played Burke. Burke was also portrayed by Donald Sutherland in the 2001 movie The Big Heist. The FBI and the NYPD organized crime investigators found possible human remains at his former home in 2013. Burke's participation in the Boston College point shaving scandal was covered in the ESPN 30 for 30 episode, Playing for the Mob, in October of 2014. The documentary's narrator is Goodfellas actor Ray Liotta, who passed away recently, RIP, who played Henry Hill in Goodfellas. In an FBI memo written in 1992, Burke was described as a known strong-arm extortionist who has traveled from New York to Florida in the past for extortionate purposes. Pause. The point of saying this is to justify why they, the FBI, are trying this case rather than local New York judges. His traveling from state to state makes this a federal crime, and that's why they're in federal court. Unpause. And is well acquainted with hijacking activities at JFK Airport, Queens, New York. At the end of the day, Burke was thought to have committed around 50 murders throughout his lifetime. He only stood trial for one, Robert Eaton. So what do you think about the Jimmy Burke story? Do you believe he had a gentleman reputation as he was made out to be? Or do you think that him being considered as the most dangerous mastermind in the mafia has ever seen was exaggerated? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching. Join me next week as I delve into the lives and legacies of some of the most fascinating and infamous figures in history. And please don't forget to like, share, subscribe, follow, comment, do all the things. Bye!